are the relationships and agreements and organizations we can create with these people? Well, one way that I've begun to sort of keep track of it in my brain is I've broken it down into four levels so you can visualize how you can be part of creating this. Well, first of all, at the first level, we start to build relationships with each other that are kind of casual and spontaneous. It might be a one-time basis of just providing for each other more. Um, borrowing a shovel rather than going out and buying one at Home Depot for that you know, one or two times you might need to use it. Sharing a ride, you know, carpooling, casually swapping, doing, just doing more favors for each other. And I think we need a culture where we all do this so much more rather than living in our little, bo you know, our little boxes, our little vacuums. But the thing about the, you know, the problem with that is if it's all casual and spontaneous, how can we rely on it to provide for us? Well, that's where the second level comes in, where we make actual agreements with each other to regularly share childcare or, or actually co-own a vacuum cleaner or co-own a car. Um, because then we can rely on that as, something, as an agreement or a relationship that can meet our needs. And then at the third level, we actually create organizations. And the great thing about organizations is that they exist even when people come and go from them. So they become lasting institutions in our communities. And I think throughout our communities, we need things like car sharing clubs and co-housing, shared housing communities and food cooperatives, shared workspaces, tool lending libraries that are going to be there as a resource where we can begin to meet our needs in a more sharing way. And then at the fourth level, we take a whole city, and here's San Francisco, but we build sharing into the infrastructure of the city. So citywide car sharing programs and citywide bike sharing programs. We could take our public library system and, and add on tool lending libraries, which is what the public library in Oakland, where I live, has. Um, and you know that old plan? It's so hard to let go of that plan. And I think so many of us are very stressed out. We feel like we have, if we have no savings, we have no assets, the future feels scary, and it's hard to let go of that impulse to try to accumulate wealth and work really hard and earn a lot of money. But if instead we were working really hard to create this society where we have all of these relationships, the casual relationships that provide for us, the agreements that provide for us, the organizations and infrastructure that provide for us, then we won't have to be so freaked out. And then we will be provided for. We'll all be provided for. And so that's what sharing lawyers do, is create those relationships and organizations. And the, the great thing about sharing law for the law students and lawyers in the room is it's a huge opportunity. It's a huge field of practice available to you. Because look at this. There are, like, are 30,000 incorporated towns in the United States. I think every town needs a sharing lawyer. And the big cities are going to need multiple sharing lawyers. And there's just there's a shortage of sharing lawyers right now, um, as you can see. So, and I, and I just I, I try to convince everyone this is really how every transactional lawyer should be practicing. This is, the, this is the economy we need to be focusing on creating. I've begun to really take this to heart and, and to look at, well, what does this mean for the, the legal profession? Well, looking at the way the legal profession is organized now, we have legal services organizations serving the poorest of the poor. We have big law firms serving the richest of the rich, who are kind of controlling a very large portion of the wealth in this country. And then we have small firms and solos who still are fairly limited in serving kind of the middle, upper middle income brackets. But who serves everybody in between? And the ABA has actually pointed out that this middle 70% of our society, their legal needs, are very underserved. And, um, the thing about the 70%, which I think is it's the 70% who are actually going to change the way we make our livelihoods, who are going to change the economy, who are going to adopt this new plan. Uh, you know, they're the majority of consumers and everything. So, so who's going to provide the legal services for the 70%? Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, this, the, yeah, 70% is who's going to be doing this. But who's going to provide the legal services? Are there any lawyers out there who have some skill and time and energy on their hands that they could use? And, um, the ABA has also pointed out that 32% of recent grads are not currently employed. So there's some folks. But you know what I say? I'm like, wait a minute. Look, we have people who are not working. We have people whose legal needs are not being met. Why is supply not meeting demand? Well, you know what that is, I realized? That is an artificial scarcity. And you know, artificial scarcity, scarcity scare me. Real scarcity scare me, like the scarcity of clean water, scarcity of fertile soil. But the cool thing about artificial scarcities is that they could be immediately remedied by society changing our behavior. Um, in the case of companies buying our water resources, that even that could be remedied if we change the laws that apply to those companies. But the cool thing about this particular scarcity 
is that every single one of us can change it by changing the way we practice law.